The Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Leaders Meeting is in the news due to the scheduled meetup between Presidents Joe Biden and Xi Jinping and also due to protests from people's movements. What is happening in San Francisco, which is hosting the summit? A harsh critic of former Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs has got bail after six years. Why was Leila de Lima in prison? And finally, French doctors are outraged at a bill that seeks to eliminate health coverage for undocumented migrants. What is this bill about? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. All eyes are on the summit of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leaders, which is taking place in San Francisco. But it's mainly because of the scheduled meeting between US President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Now, the two leaders last met almost a year ago, but relations between the two countries tanked soon after, before gaining some stability in recent times. But the meeting is not the only highlight of the summit. People's movements have been holding protests against the very structure of the forum and its agenda. Anish has the details. Anish, very important summit of leaders of one of the most volatile areas right now in the world. Of course, no active wars taking place, thankfully, but a lot of geopolitical tension in the region, which you have been covering very extensively. And like I said, the highlight of all this seems to be the meeting between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden uh, taking place after almost a year. There's been it's a, the ties between these two countries have really seesawed over the past many months. So what are the sort of uh, you know, expectations or what are the key issues that people think, uh, you know, are, are expected to be discussed in this meeting? Well, uh, if we actually go by some of the statements that have been made uh, since last month about uh, with the, to the run up to this meeting that is hap that is going to happen, uh, what we can say is that there is a, a certain understanding between both sides, and which is something as we have covered on the show is rare. Uh, in the in the last couple of years on uh, certain issues, uh, which is that trade cannot be compromised, trade cannot be affected by disputes that ar arise between these two countries. Uh, obviously, the two largest economies in the world, the two uh, major uh, producers of uh, various things uh, in the world are not to be at uh, loggerheads and that is going to affect everybody. And so the fact that the uh, there is more coverage right now, as you can see, um, of the upcoming meeting than uh, the actual uh, APEC summit of the 21 uh, uh, economies, it clearly shows that this is far more important right now uh, at the current moment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you actually look at some of the aspects of their statements where they do not uh, you know, have any kind of understanding or you do not see any kind of concurrence. It's uh, basically on the issues uh, that they want to avoid being affected by trade or, you know, be, uh, affecting trade itself. So, for instance, Taiwan, uh, US wants to keep bringing it up. Uh, China wants to assert the fact that Taiwan has to be uh, dealt with within the one China policy that has been, uh, you know, insisted upon by both China and Taiwan, and also every other country in the world. And so, uh, and obviously the fact that there is, uh, that sovereignty of the region cannot be compromised uh, because U.S. thinks that some of the government, uh, a government there needs to be supported by them. Uh, you also see uh, issues of South China Sea uh, coming up, but uh, only by China this time and not so much by the United States, despite the fact that it has, you know, brought itself into the conflict uh, virtually through uh, you know different proxies especially philippines at this point and uh, there are other issues that uh, the us wants to talk about uh, one is uh, the ukraine crisis but not more than that it's the it's the uh, the crisis in gaza right now in palestine uh, where it wants to actually try to use china it thinks that china can somehow control Iran or other regional players that are, uh, you know, uh, you know, raising uh, warnings against Israel for their escalation and their violence, and or you know to actually escalate the Middle East crisis, which is something that China has not talked about. But we, we will we will have to see how they are going to go forward with that. 
uh, if there is going to be any kind of understanding. But definitely the U.S., as we have also covered, the U.S. has very different ideas about how uh, the violence there should be dealt with than vis-a-vis -vis China, obviously. So that aside, you will actually see trade as being the most important and central part of this meeting. So while there might be statements from both sides on different issues, this is going to be the main, the key and the most uh, important one for them, because obviously there are pressures, uh, especially within the United States, especially within the capitalist class, who have been obviously threatened by uh, China's attempt to restrict rare earth minerals, uh, who would be affected by it, uh, to actually find a middle ground with China so that they do not have they do not lose that large market that they obviously depended on uh, for a lot of their own innovations at this point in time. So there is definitely that pressure, and that is going to be the central, uh, you know, uh, central piece, uh, so to say, of this meeting in San Francisco. Well, Anish, like you said, a uh, lot of attention paid on the meeting of these two presidents, but the fact also is that the APEC summit has also been, there have been a lot of protests around the summit as well, which is quite interesting and often ignored by a lot of the media, which focuses only on the geopolitical aspect, people's movements taking to the streets with a variety of demands. So can you maybe also take us through what some of those aspects were? Well, I think at the central uh, aspect of uh, the protest or any kind of criticism against APEC is the fact that it is a body that is not representative uh, it has no representation or any kind of democratic representation from any of the countries. It's basically uh, led by technocrats and politicians and, uh, you know, uh, corporations. And for the fact that they actually push for some kind of a free trade arrangement that can actually affect sovereign control over various issues, including, uh, you know, quality control uh, or, you know, protection for their farmers, for their own companies and their economy. And that is something that has been at the heart of the protest right now. And this is something that they, uh, the protesters have been talking about. It's not a new thing. It has been happening for a while now. Every APEC summit, you actually see massive protests happening uh, everywhere it has happened. And San Francisco is known, nothing new at this point. But they are actually bringing out uh, this fact uh, factor, reiterating these um, uh, facts, of, uh, these aspects of the summit and the organization itself. Uh, Sorry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can actually see protesters also uh, bringing out, uh, you know, U.S. attempts to uh, push countries into uh, at least not doing, if not doing, uh, able to doing its line on Palestine and Israel, but at least, uh, you know, accepting some aspects of their uh, line on the matter. And you can actually see a significant section of uh, pro-Palestinian uh, protesters within the, uh, the current set of protests in San Francisco, primarily because, as I said, like there is an attempt by them to uh, push for a certain uh, level of uh, criticism or maybe even isolation of the Hamas or other Palestinian uh, resistance fighters, which may, many of the countries may or may not agree to, but there is definitely an attempt to the, towards that. Um, and this, these aspects also highlight the key uh, issue with APEC as well, because that it is another tool of imperialism as well. It is a culmination of that. And that is something that many have talked about. Uh, APEC has all often been used as a forum to, uh, you know, run through various policies that many countries may not accept, but has been pressured into. And uh, many, uh, very many times you actually have very unpopular governments uh, taking up, um, you know, policies that will affect national interest of their country, especially when it comes to South Korea, Philippines and other countries, uh, even Chile. And uh, in most of these cases, imperialism has always been the issue that has affected their national economy, their national interest over time. And that is something that the protesters have been definitely highlighting. And obviously, we, we are also highlighting at this point through the through our coverage. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that analysis. But do stay back because we are coming back to the Philippines, one of the countries you recently mentioned, is, which is being used as a proxy as well. So we'll come back to that. After six years in jail, Leila de Lima, a former senator and fierce critic of the drug war in the Philippines, finally got bail. This so-called war against drug, drugs in which thousands were killed was the handiwork of former President Rodrigo Duterte. It was widely condemned, but to this day, there has been no institutional accounting for the murders. We go back to Anish. Right, welcome back, Anish. Uh, six years in jail for being critical of 
uh, Rodrigo Duterte's so-called war on drugs, which has actually been widely condemned by organizations across the world and rights organizations. So maybe could you take us a bit to the case itself? Why was this uh, former senator behind the bars? Well, uh, the case itself is about, uh, it was just a frame up uh, of her uh, in very ironic, not so ironically, actually, if you think about it, on a drug charge uh, that she had facilitated uh, illegal or illicit drug trade uh, through her contacts and through her influence as a senator. Um, but this uh, aspect of it uh, doesn't really look to the fact that she has been one of the most vocal critics in the Philippines Congress when it comes to uh, the war on drugs. And that is that has been one of the reasons why most uh, civil rights, uh, civil society organizations have uh, condemned uh, this attempt to basically shut her down. Uh, and that is something that uh, pretty much was in part vindicated when she was given bail, considering that the, uh, the evidence and even the arrest procedures were quite uh, shoddy and uh, you know had its own uh, set of problems. Nevertheless, uh, the fact that uh, she is out right now means that she will be able to, uh, uh, she won't be able to uh, do as uh, she might be if she was completely left, uh, you know, without charge. So she has to fight her case. Uh, she is yet to be declared uh, not guilty of the charges against her. And that means that she will be under certain set of restrictions. Uh, but on the other hand, she is free to, uh, you know, meet with people, organize in some ways uh, for the cause that she believes in. And that is something that a lot of people are celebrating at this point. But the important aspect of this, obviously, is the fact that uh, there has been a, a wide use of uh, misuse of uh, law enforcement agency and obviously the, uh, you know, uh, the anti-drug uh, trafficking laws in the country to actually stifle civil society. And she, her arrest was, in fact, cited as one of the key uh, examples of how civil society groups and anybody critical of the government has been targeted by the anti-drug uh, uh, trade laws in the country and even you know, killed at some level. She, obviously, she was a senator, so she had some level of immunity. But many civil society act grassroots activists were killed. We had journalists killed. Uh, in the past that we have covered about who were uh, later uh, framed as uh, having, uh, you know, practiced in drug trade on, based on very flimsy evidence. And they were often targeted by vigilante groups that were uh, pro Duterte at the time. So this violent uh, sort of uh, history, very recent history, actually, that uh, Philippines had in the five or six years that Duterte ran the country, uh, it uh, this the this aspect uh, pretty much also illustrates how you know the, how there was a generalized violence when it came to uh, this war on drugs campaign where most of the victims were not necessarily people who were uh, you know uh, involved in the drug trade and even those who were involved many of them were uh, you know uh, dependent on substance abuse rather than being uh, you know people who were tra uh, involved in the trade itself. And many times we have seen uh, how it is more likely that law enforcement agency were uh, mixed up with the, uh, the drug trafficking networks. Uh, very recently with uh, Percy Lattice assassination, we've seen how that nexus uh, went really high up into the government event. And so that these factors were often uh, avoided. And, you know, as I said, like the attack has always been to whip up certain kind of, uh, you know, nationalistic, very right-wing sort of frenzy, very populist frenzy uh, at the expense of people's lives and obviously, uh, you know, general democratic rights uh, in the Philippines as well. Ranish, of course, uh, we know that some of this was condemned internationally. In fact, the ICC also, it was brought before the ICC also at some point. But within Philippines itself, after Duterte's term, has there been any re-evaluation uh, or reconsideration of all these policies of the intense damage it caused society? Well, there has been some um, statements. Uh, we have seen uh, former officials and even current ones, uh, the Justice Department talking about uh, so-called um, uh, misuse or abuse of power. Um, but the, uh, And even there is some uh, admission on the part of government uh, on the number of killing, we have a certain, you know, an official record of more than 5,000 uh, people killed in the anti-drug operations. 
Uh, but in most cases, uh, what is overlooked is how it has animated a certain section of the society uh, a, into becoming vigilantes. And that is what uh, where the violence, the primary aspect of the violence was. Uh, many people were basically just empowered with, uh, you know, outside of constitutional set up uh, to target uh, the suspected drug traffickers and many of them it was obviously abused none of that has been uh, admitted to there has been some level of uh, reorganization within the police but and uh, but all of that whatever uh, official admission we have seen has only come after multiple uh, you know a very consistent set of international pressures uh, and uh, not the least of icc but definitely of different organizations around the world and also within the Philippines who have exposed, and also uh, several media outlets have exposed uh, the corruption that, is, uh, that has gone behind uh, these uh, anti-drug operations and also the kind of violence that has, uh, you know, dam uh, caused, as you said, major damages in the civil society. So these factors are, uh, that, that those pressures are the reason why you have some level of admission but not enough to actually bring people to books. There hasn't been any major convictions uh, that can actually uh, bring, in, uh, bring to account people who are responsible for it. Uh, some people were uh, either given leave or, uh, you know, asked to take, uh, you know, early retirement. But other than that, in the reorganization, but other than that, uh, you don't have any major uh, person uh, being held accountable for this matter. And least of all, obviously, Duterte, who actually began this entire frenzy, uh, he co continues to be scot-free in the current system, in fact, being protected by uh, the government under uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, in fact, uh, he has been protected even more so uh, against any kind of international pressures even. So that clearly shows that the current government does not want actual people to uh, be held accountable or change the uh, the setup itself that has actually caused and continues to cause violence and killings in the current setup. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that analysis as well. And finally, members of the Senate in France are proposing to scrap health coverage for undocumented immigrants. The move has been fiercely opposed by doctors who have said they will disobey it if this law is passed and will provide treatment even if they are not paid for it. We go to Anna of the People's Health Movement for more details. Uh, thanks, Anna, for joining us. So before we go into the exact demands and points by the doctors could you maybe give us a brief context what is this bill what is what is the senate trying to amend what exactly is this about well france has uh, a measure called the state medical uh, assistance in place uh, since uh, the early 2000s uh, the point of this uh, mechanism is to provide health care to undocumented people uh, who have no access to uh, to other uh, other ways of accessing health care so uh, the measure uh, was introduced, and, and since it was introduced, it has been a contested point from the right, particularly uh, because of the usual argument. So the right-wing parties are claiming that it's too expensive, that people uh, are um, are using it too much, or that even it's uh, and uh, it's inviting. Uh, undocumented and irregular mig migration into France. Uh, of course, uh, proof and um, and research by civil society as well as uh, academics has pr proven over and over again that this is wrong. Of course, that you know, uh, still uh, more than twenty years after the introduction of the bill, uh, the overall cost of uh, of the mechanism is less than one percent of the total health uh, health expenditure in France. Uh, and it's essentially uh, underused even among those who have the right to access it. It's definitely not recognized as a significant reason for people immigrating to France. So um, essentially what um, what we are looking at if uh, if the if the measure is abolished, if uh, if uh, the parliament passes this law, uh, is that people who now have access to uh, a wider ra range of uh, healthcare services, including primary health healthcare, which we know is very important for um, providing uh, good quality healthcare, comprehensive healthcare, they will be forced to use the health system only in uh, in case of emergency. Uh, which again, of course, makes it less secure. So it makes health outcomes worse. It also makes the uh, it also makes the procedures 
more expensive. So what the opponents of this amendment to the bill uh, are saying is that what makes sense is not only to keep the uh, the state medical assistance in place, but also to expand it and to make sure that people are more aware of it, that it's easier to use. Right. And so could you uh, explain a bit more detail some of the points the doctors have made? I believe there's a letter also and they've taken a very strong stand, I believe, even saying that they will disobey this law if it's brought to practice here. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, that's right. So uh, this weekend, uh, over 3,000 French doctors signed an open letter saying that even if this uh, this amendment is passed uh, as a part of uh, this wider immigration re reform in France, uh, they will continue to provide care to undocumented people. They, they, uh, they said that the, they will do so, although they know that... Um, it's going. Uh, it, it's not going to be paid. So essentially, what what will happen in this case uh, will be that the doctors will provide care, which is usually then reimbursed through the health insurance mechanisms. In this case, of course, it won't be. So it will be unpaid work. But they say that uh, it's uh, you know because of the importance of providing healthcare to this population group that it's uh, it's essentially worth it, and that uh, when the right wing parties are proposing something that goes against uh, the the right to health in this regard is that essentially they're not um, they're not making a significant contribution to health reform to improving healthcare or even to reducing expenses they're just using something as a talking point of theirs because they find it opportune to do so um, so of course you know the the health workers have be have also been supported by other uh, by other groups. It has to be said in this regard that the government is not supporting this amendment to the bill. It's not something that's coming from, from the Macron government. It's coming from uh, from the right-wing uh, part of the parliament. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a bit unclear uh, how how important this is going to be uh, since uh, since it's, it's expected because of the divisions in parliament that uh, at least the Senate will pass the bill quite uh, quite easily. But then, uh, on a different uh, on a different point, uh, civil society organizations have been very vocal in the pe period leading up to this discussion in the parliament that the measure which is being suggested is essentially, you know, uh, it's uh, it, it's a failed <laughs> it 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 has failed even 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 before it started. Uh, as I said, people are already underusing uh, the measure of uh, of the state medical assistance because because of a number of reasons. Just one recent report by uh, Doctors of the World with uh, other civil society organizations has shown that people avoid, well, okay, so uh, many of them don't even know that they have the right to use this, uh, uh, this mechanism. Then for others, it's simply a, a question of barriers in language or in financial barriers. They don't have internet, they don't have money to, uh, to uh, upload the uh, phone credits. Then there's a whole set of administrative procedures, uh, which were essentially introduced because of, uh, you know, of the right wing uh, pressures uh, before. Uh, and so essentially what they're saying is it's uh, it's not about scrapping it. It's about making it work. It's about it making it more functional so uh, that the benefits of this uh, of this program can can be felt. And uh, thank you so much for that analysis. Everywhere across Europe, it seems very clear that, you know, a very stringent and strident stand being taken against uh, immigration, against refugees, against asylum seekers. And we are seeing this attack taking place in the health sector as well. Very interesting that doctors across the country are taking a very principled and you know, ethical position against such kind of laws. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. And that's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with a fresh episode. Until then, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And if you're watching this on YouTube, do hit that subscribe button. Thank you.